Hey guys, welcome, welcome to the class. As you can see, we're in our, um, I guess, side yard again. This is uh, late at night, which I about 11 o'clock tonight under the trees, and my favorite time of the day is the night. So what I want to do is continue with you in these classes. I'm sorry for the hat; it helps. Uh, helps keep these headphones from sliding off my bald head and I have to monitor the wind. We've had some pretty bad wind today so I'm hoping we don't have trouble with that so I want to listen and make sure. So uh, let's get right back into our study in Romans chapter 8. I want to turn there we're going to cover a little, just just very little, of what we have been, or what we said in our previous class. We'll touch on that a little bit and then move on, because this is a very part, a very important part of this chapter, and I think it'll help us to understand what Paul is doing here. And let me just preface all of this with this statement. And it's a statement that, that I think is missing a lot of the time when <clears throat> we are uh, uh, speaking about or referring to salvation and that has to do with the fact that when we're speaking of salvation and the thing that we read here in chapter 8, what Paul is conveying to us, what he is actually saying, what he is actually presenting for the believer is a total freedom, a total deliverance from the previous state of being in Adam. Total. It is a complete break. As he says in Colossians chapter 2, it is a circumcision, the putting off of an entire body of death or an entire body of sins. Same thing, not a difference, same thing being stated there. It is an entire body of sins, entire body of death that is being addressed here that we have put off, that the work of the Spirit of God that we call new birth brings our soul into a complete liberty from all previous conditions, the previous enslavements, the previous uh, relationships. And, and that comes into play when we're looking at uh, things such as the metaphors the word pictures that Paul uses. Um, Paul uses metaphors such as the husband in Romans 7, the husband that the wife is married to. He's speaking of our first state under Adam. He's speaking of those who were married to the first man and therefore in a state of sin because that man was the one who dictated that condition that made fruit unto God impossible and made fruit unto death the only result possible. Therefore, there had to be a once and for all work, an absolute work, a substantial, effectual work, that actually broke the contract between the husband and the woman. And what was that work? Death. The death of the husband. And therefore, when he's dead, she is now dead to him, and therefore dead to the law of that husband. And when we speak of the law of that husband, we're not merely speaking of the law of Moses. And I think we have to understand that, to, to understand these things, and it's going to be clearer in classes to come. You can't have the one without the other. The other. We're talking about the internal 
law of sin and death that governed, that made necessary the imposing of the law of Moses over the soul that was governed by the kingdom of death. To do what? To not imprison the soul in death. It didn't do, didn't do that. Uh, the law of Moses did not create sin or make us sinners. It didn't bring us into the imprisonment of sin and death. That was a state of being we were born into because we were born of corruptible seed. The law of Moses was employed by God, implemented by God, to do a couple of things. But one of the main things is to expose man and show him the depth of his captivity to that internal kingdom of death and sin and corruption so that he would understand that he needed for anything toward God, anything of spiritual value, anything at all, to be his as his possession, he had to receive some internal change there had to be something internal because externals didn't do it there had to be an external an internal change an internal work a miracle of god to bring about that true complete deliverance so when we talk about salvation i think we miss it so many times that this is what we're talking about is absolutely a complete freedom from the first state of being in Adam to an altogether new, altogether perfect, altogether other state of being under the headship of Christ himself. A headship that does not make See in our state, but has provided a righteousness, excuse me, <laughs> but has provided a righteousness to our soul that was not attainable and never has been and never will be. It's not an attainable thing, it is a gift. But I want us to understand that clear that clear point that when we speak of our salvation, we're not speaking of one foot in one age and one foot in another, one foot in sin and one foot in righteousness. And depending on the day and maybe depending on the moment and depending on the attitude that you may have or the some, something that happens, you could be one or the other. No. It's a once and for all act that new birth has brought us to the good of and has set us free by death being dead to it being dead to sin and therefore alive unto God uh, no longer slaves to sin but now slaves of righteousness because Paul says it very plainly I know I've beat this horse before but Paul says it very plainly and I wish we could just grasp the singularity and the simplicity of this statement that if you are a slave to sin, and that's an internal enslavement, not because you do things or perform bad acts, that's not sin. That's why the definite article is in most literal translations in the Greek. It is the sin. And the only thing that could remedy the sin as a state of being is the grace that superabounds where the sin once abounded. The sin has been put away once and for all. And the righteous one by the grace of God has come and he abides. 
he abides. So if we are slaves, internally bound to, under the masterhood and sovereign rule of sin, which was our first condition, all men, Jew or Gentile, then we are free from, that means delivered entirely from and out of the reach of, it can't reach us at all, and we can't reach it. There's a chasm that is unbridgeable between us. If we are in this state, we cannot be in this state. We cannot be in righteousness or have righteousness as our condition if we are governed by sin internally no matter what you do. That is the necessity of must be born again because that's when the change happens. And I wish we understood that. I wish we haven't discounted new birth to the degree that we have in the church world. The new birth is just the just the starting point for the stuff to actually start trickling in little by little. And you're going to have to qualify for some, and you're going to have to really grit your teeth to get through it, and it's going to be hard. Come unto me, Jesus says. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. It's not hard. And you know why it's not hard? Because you didn't do any of it. Neither can you do any of it. If it was up to you to do any of it, we would still be waiting for redemption. <laughs> we have come to his rest. We have been brought into a perfect state, embodied in a perfect man. And a salvation without sin that is, that is described and defined in one beautiful phrase. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. If we just sit for a moment, I think, and meditate upon just that phrase and hopefully allow that phrase to bring in so many other phrases that are throughout Paul's letters and the other letters of the other apostles we would understand how comprehensive of a statement that really is and how that describes such a, such a true deliverance. Such a true salvation, deliverance, same word. Such a true healing, same word. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? That healing, delivered, and saved are really the same word in many ways, in many cases throughout the scripture. When he tells the woman, and we've dealt with this <clears throat> before, when we, I forget exactly the podcast I did, um, I think it's called The, the Cure, um, something, the, 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 the something in The Cure, The Permanent Cure. But, that cure was an immediate cure that came to the woman with the issue of blood, which was a which was under the law meant that she was unclean, ceremonially by the law unclean, couldn't be touched and could not touch anyone, could not be around people, had to hide away, and if she came in public at all, she had to hold her hand over her mouth and, uh, you know, in shame and, and, and say unclean, unclean, because that was the picture. And we're seeing in that whole uh, story with her, not just a story, but it does, it's there to educate us concerning the covenant, because this is what these miracles are all about. Him confirming his covenant to Israel and saying, if you come to me, this is the miracle I will work in you. And what was that miracle with the woman with the issue of blood? That her issue, which was uncleanness, which was an internal malady, that could not be cured 
That's us in sin. That's what the picture's about. Couldn't be cured. It was, there was no way. And she had spent all of her fortune, all of her money, whether it was fortune or not, but all that she had, she had spent it all on doctors telling her nothing we can do. Or try this, try that, nothing we can do. And nothing helped. No help, no fix, no remedy. But, and that's kind of, and that's the whole issue the law did. The law kept showing, you see, no help. There's no remedy. Only one remedy. That's it. And she heard that Jesus was coming and she snuck in from the back, came through the crowd because she couldn't ceremonially be seen. She really was breaking the law. Could have been killed, stoned. And the law does with all of us. So we can read it in Romans 3. We have read it many times. The law has concluded all men under sin, whether Jew or Gentile, that all are sinful. Why? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, regardless of your lineage, race. So knowing her uncleanness, she still knew that there was only one hope for her, and it was to touch Jesus. She had to touch him. And when she touched him that very moment, it said immediately her issue of blood was dried up. The thing that no one else could heal, the thing that could not be fixed, remedied, or cured in all of this time and all of the money that she had spent, one touch of him cured it immediately. And when she finally has to confess to him what happened and what she did, and here and, and you'll have to go to it to see all that, that was said in that because it's such a beautiful picture. The fact is, she touched him. Her uncleanness never passed on to him. When she touched him, he cured her uncleanness, and that's the whole work of God in salvation. Many times we are led to believe, and this is how... This is kind of what, because we're going to talk about this. I hope I get to the message. In Romans 8, uh, verse, uh, oh, what is it? Verse 12, 13, 14 is what we're going to be reading. But verse 12, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. We're not debtors to the flesh. We're not debtors to the Adamic condition. We are not debtors to Sin, we are not debtors to that first condition. Because he's just talked about, brethren, you are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit. H how do we prove that, Paul? You don't prove it. He's proven it already because he has put the spirit of God in you. And if the spirit is in you, then you can't be in the flesh. Remember, if you're in sin, you can't be righteous. If you're righteous, you can't be in sin. They are not even close to one another, they are mutually exclusive entities because they are defined in two mutually exclusive, altogether different men, Adam and Christ. And I wish we could understand that picture of the immediate deliverance and the immediate healing but here's the point and this is where I was when she touched him her malady her uncleanness did not communicate over to Jesus he was not affected by her uncleanness his perfection affected her state and changed it from unclean to whole To cured immediately. And that word immediately is said two or three times in that beautiful picture. Why? Because there's a point trying to be made there. He makes the point beautifully. He tries his best to say it. Who, who's writing this to say, man, this was immediate. This is not a progress, pro, a progressive thing. This is not a process of eliminating this and gaining this. No, when she touched him, 
this happen immediately. And this is what I'm saying. This is what I'm saying. The church world would have us believe Christianity as it's taught, unfortunately, so many times, would have us almost believe that we can, in some way, communicate our uncleanness to his perfection. And that's why we're always told, yeah, not quite yet. You're not quite there yet. You're not quite good enough yet. You're not quite righteous enough yet. So come up to the altar and pray through. Or come over here and let's help you out. Let's give you these steps to reach uh, holiness. Let's give you this element where you can be sanctified a little more. He is made unto us sanctification. You ever thought of that? No. When we touched him, the moment we touched him, the moment our souls came into contact with the spirit of life, Paul would say, we were set free from the law of sin and death. We were set free from that first state, from that first condition, from the malady of uncleanness that was ours due to a birth condition called sin. The touching of him in new birth, or him touching us, was a once and for all cure. Nothing else needed. Yes, we want to know him, we want to grow in this grace and the understanding of what has occurred, what has happened, what is this great reality that he's given in his love and by his grace and through his mercy, what is it? We want to grow in that understanding and we have been given, thank God, the spirit of God that we may know these things that have been freely given as a gift. But the fact is, what we have been given has immediately cured us of our previous malady. And I know we can all think of our maladies. Let me, let me share with you. I've been writing the book uh, concerning these Romans classes. I'm in two and three chapters in right now. Can't finish the second chapter because of something I want to share with you about the sovereign rule of Christ. And we'll get to that. <clears throat> But in the first chapter, I have pretty well completed the way I want it. I talk about this idea of, I'm sure you guys have heard this, and I, and I won't try to read it in my mind from the page, but have you ever had these people that are called in to the, to the service and they tell them, say, well, Hey, give your testimony. <clears throat> and so what is the testimony? Well, this, this guy comes in now. He's a Christian. Well, his testimony is he used to be a really bad drug addict or a really bad porn addict or a really bad, he was a pimp or she, she was a prostitute or, oh God, you know, these people come in and give their testimony. And the testimony, the, 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 true, the, the true measure of the greatness of the testimony has to do with the measure of the depth of the sin they were in before they were born again. If we're going, they had this experience with God that made them stop doing that stuff, right? So, you know, these testimonies, and they'd come in, all these, go to all these churches to give their testimony, and people would go like, wow, you know, how great that is, that that deliverance has happened for them, and what a testimony. Just imagine now... <clears throat> This person was called in to give their testimony, and they got up on stage and they said, uh, well, I was guilty in my mother's womb and in sin did my mother conceive me. I was in sin the day I was born. I was born dead in sin. Not much of a testimony, <laughs> right? Not much of a testimony, right? Yes, that is the testimony of us all. 
In fact, everybody listening to that testimony could say, hey, man, what makes you so special? I have that same testimony. Exactly. And that testimony is more valid than the one of the pimp, the prostitute, or the drug addict. Why? Because we were dead in sin. We don't amplify one particular area that we were weak in or one particular area that we really screwed up in and one particular thing that we're really good at, really good at being bad at. And say, hey, there's my deliverance. No, your deliverance was from death unto life. The depths of that captivity was immense. The depth of that depravity was undescribable. The depth of sin, whether you sinned one day in your life, was already as deep and as ugly as it could possibly be the moment you were conceived. But here's the beauty of new birth. The moment we are born again, that whole ugly thing is cut off, is put away once and for all, never to be seen again, never to be known again by God, hopefully by us as we grow. It is immediate, cured. So when Jesus tells the woman after she has confessed what she has done, he said, woman, your faith, there's the remedy, there's the means of it, faith in him, faith, the believing into him, faith by which we are saved through grace, not of works, lest any man should boast, it is the gift of God. But he tells this woman, your faith has made you whole. That word means that your faith has saved you. Other, your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. There's the healing. Your faith has saved you. Salvation. Because that's what this whole thing's a picture of. Salvation. From unclean to cured in one touch. Immediate. And because of that, Paul Speaking to the Roman believers can write these words, and these words, please make no mistake, these words are in no way severed or separate from what he has already been saying concerning his own deliverance from his Romans 7 condition, which is a man under the law of Moses and under the, con under the condemnation of the law of Moses, because he is under the sovereign government of the law of sin and death that is internal. See, all men, specifically, of course, the Jew, but all men according to the scripture, the law condemned them because there was an internal law that that law had to condemn because the law of Moses was a testimony of a life that this internal law of all men who were born of their mothers for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God from birth. The law, that sin, that internal state was altogether contrary from the perfection that the law of Moses was presenting, and the law of Moses was not presenting a perfect Adamic man or a perfect natural man. He was presenting the perfect man of spirit who would come as the cure, as the remedy for that internal corruptibility. And that is the resurrection himself, right? I am the life. I am the resurrection. It's that life that the law demanded but could not provide, according to Galatians 3. Because if that law could have provided uh, uh, life, then righteousness would have been by the law. Yeah. That's why it is said in 1 Corinthians 15, if he is not risen from the dead, then we are all really messed up now and uh, have no hope here and we're still in our sins. Because that's the whole point of 1 Corinthians 15 is showing the resurrection, is showing the true resurrection, which is to bring us from death unto 
life, the resurrection and the life himself, the life-giving spirit. When does that happen? It happens at new birth. The putting off of corruption and the putting on of incorruptibility happens at new birth. We grow in the understanding of that as we see him, as he is revealed in us, yes. But that transaction, that immediate cure, that immediate severing and cutting off of the first and coming is an immediate once and for all action on God's part. Leaving us now, as Paul would say here, we are no longer debtors. We are debtors not. We are not debtors to the flesh, to live after <clears throat> the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, <coughs> excuse me, you die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, we'll talk about that in a moment, hopefully. Because we've messed all of this up too. You will live. If you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live for all who are led by the Spirit. They are the sons of God. This is so huge. This is a huge statement. And the problem is we have isolated almost every one of these verses from each other. We've divorced them from one another, and specifically, we've truly and totally divorced them from the context of the whole, just the chapter of this letter. So when we talk about being led by the Spirit, we think He's just telling us where to go eat and where to go shop and what to do here and what to do there. And I have no problems in saying, yes, the Lord leads us all. I know many times in not recent past, in recent past, I'm sorry, that I know that he has led me and guided my direction. That's wonderful. He does that. But this being led of the Spirit of God and being the sons of God has to do with the Spirit of God bringing us to this condition of no longer debtors to the flesh. What does that mean? He brings us from flesh to spirit. He brings us from the first to the second, from Adam to Christ. Death to life. Therefore, we are no longer obligated to live as if we are under the first. The first man, the first condition, the whatever. Um, <clears throat> I want to read... Jameson Fawcett and Brown's commentary of this is really beautiful because he utilizes this, what we always talk about. We have to keep these words that Paul says here in context because if you don't contextualize these words, you can isolate them and you can eisegete them, which means read things into it or read yourself into it or read other things into it that are not there. And what this Jameson, Foss, and Brown commentary does in this verse is really rightly shows how these statements are, are actually mirroring statements that he's already made throughout this very letter. Listen, listen to this. Therefore, brethren, and this is them just going through the verse and then we'll, they'll give references. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. And then he, he takes that and he refers it to something. Because once we were sold under sin, that's Romans seven fourteen. That's what Paul talks about as a man under the law. It means he was sold under, under the masterhood who has bought him off the slave block. He was owned by sin. But now... That we have been set free from that hard master and become servants to righteousness. And that's Romans 6.22. Being servants now of righteousness, we are free from sin. So he's showing how these things connect with other parts of this letter. Meaning, Paul is not changing subjects or changing the flow of his thought. He is actually carrying the flow. And he beautifully, from the first chapter, we've already talked about it. We've covered every chapter in this letter already and shown how he has just beautifully 
built this letter and to make this glorious point that we're talking about now and how he's done it masterfully. And this commentary shows that, how he's just continuing the flow, building, and how he masterfully uses metaphors and word pictures and just to just to broaden his point as he goes throughout the whole thing. Just wonderful. But so now we are free from the hard master and become servants of righteousness. Romans 6.22 again. We owe nothing to the flesh. We owe nothing to it. We're not debtors to it. We disown its unrighteous claims on us and are deaf to its demands. And he says, glorious sentiment. Glorious, yeah, absolutely. Again, because Paul is encouraging them and he is exhorting them in the absoluteness of what they have now in Christ, in the Spirit, as as those in whom the Spirit of life himself dwells. He is encouraging them in the certainty of a present condition of freedom, of true deliverance from a state of sin and death and corruptibility. We're not born again to now try to progressively work our way out of the hole. through whatever activities, whatever religious zealous uh, rites and ceremonies we invent. No. That is not our obligation. Why? Because God has done something we could not do. God has brought us from the first to the second. He has cut ties totally with that thing. You can't be obligated to something you're dead to. Because he's dead to it. And if you're dead with Christ to sin and alive with Christ unto God, you are not obligated to be performing for the thing you're dead to. It's just like the wife in Romans 7, after that husband's dead, she's still cooking dinner and putting it on the table. Why? Your obligation to him is over. And we can think about many ways we do the same, right? We try to pray for Saul, just like David did. Try to get him under, try to get him right, try to fix his his insubordination to God, try to fix this man, this a king, and try to get him right. And what does God say? Stop it. Stop praying for this man because I have thoroughly rejected him as king. He's not king anymore as far as I'm concerned. But wait a minute, he's on the throne. He's not king. God's already picked his king. Now, go anoint my king. Go get my king. You see that? And that's the immediacy of the thing. And you say, yeah, but David wasn't on the throne yet. But when did he actually become king? When he sat on the throne or when God told Samuel, go anoint my king? When was he really the king? We have to understand that. The immediacy of this is important to grasp. The absoluteness of this deliverance, this great salvation is important to grasp. This is very important for us to keep before us in context. The absence of indebtedness is exactly the same thing as Paul saying we are free from sin because we are now slaves of righteousness. The change of husband, getting to these metaphors again, the change of husband, the change of head, the change of master removes all obligation to its claims upon you, to the previous claims of the previous head. Now let's look at the definition of the word debtor. It is 3781 in the Strong's Concordance. 
Ophilete is the word. Ophilites or something. Ophiletis. I don't know. Head of lettuce. I don't know. I'm not Greek. But the word debtor here means an owner or an oer. Not an owner, but an oer. The opposite of an owner. The one who owes something. A person indebted to another. It even says a delinquent. A moral transgressor against God. This is from uh, Strong's. A debtor. And it's... It's um, it's also defined as sinner. Sinner. In fact, it's interesting that the word debtor and sinner are used interchangeably in uh, Luke chapter uh, 13. You go there and look at it. Sinner and debtor are used interchangeably there. That should give us a hint of this. That we are not debtors to the flesh. We're not debtors to sin. We are not debtors to the thing we're dead to. So that we would live as if we're still in it and still obligated to it. Why? Because there's been a clean break from it by the work of circumcision. It's been cut off. That husband's dead. I'm not cooking dinner for him again. Right? Just let's get it as simple as possible, right? Another, uh, <clears throat> the um, prolonged word of 3781 is 3784, means debtor, and it means to be under obligation to, to be bound to, to be a debtor, and to be guilty of debt. To be indebted, thus guilty. And that's what this says. It says be guilty, and then in parenthesis it says indebted, showing it being the same. Wow. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? The law of the spirit of life has made me free. What does that mean? I'm not indebted to it. Romans 7 shows you a man who's indebted to it. That sense of indebtedness is the thing that fuels false religion. And unfortunately, preachers love not all the time, because I, it's it's almost it's a it's a beautiful balancing game. It's ugly, but it's a beautiful way people do it. This balancing game where too much of it, too much of it, hurts. Too much of it would cause people to rebel. But just a little of it, sprinkled in at the times that are right. At opportune moments perfect it keeps them in line and I'm telling you that's what most preachers do a lot, a lot of preachers do that I hear they may not do it purposefully but they do it because they think that's the way it's done they try to obligate you to live in a way that you're no longer obligated to live in because that obligation is an obligation of a man who is still under the law or in sin and death. They like to show there's no condemnation until there's a moment in time where a little bit of guilt will help. No. No. When we talk again about the, the woman in Romans 7, it says this word is bound to her husband as long as he lives. Same word here. Or it's a variation of that word. This woman is bound, obligated to, indebted to, under obligation to serve him as long as he lives. That's what the cross did. It took care of that. 
He doesn't live anymore. So why should we live as if we're still under that obligation? Well, that we're still under that servitude. Because we're not. Not at all. Why? Because of the once and for all immediate work that new birth has brought about, which is not I, but Christ liveth in me. I am dead to sin by him, through him, and alive unto God through him. I am, by the work of the grace of God, no longer a slave of sin and therefore free from righteousness. No, I am a slave of righteousness. I have been bought with a price. That is a direct picture of a slave being bought. We are now slaves of righteousness. We are brought into a true, God-given, divinely orchestrated enslavement to Christ our head, our husband, our king, our master. But this master, this king, this head, does not demand what he cannot help provide, What uh, de de uh, demands something he does not equip you to do. This head, this husband, this king, grants kindly and goodly gifts to his subjects. Gives the gift to his subjects of the very thing he demands. Word uh, debtor keeps on. Let's see. Let's. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one who is obligated, one who must do through obligation. Uh, one held by an obligation bound to a duty. The power of the latter having been broken since he is within the sphere of the Holy Spirit. He is under no obligation to sin to live under its dominion. There's that word, dominion. This is, this is not a choice, but a state resulting through a once and for all translation out of death into life, out of sin into righteousness. It's not a choice we're making. We're not saying, well, should I be a sinner today or should I be a saint? No. If you're born again, there's no choice in it. You have come under the headship of an altogether new man. You have come into the kingdom ruled by the Son of God's love. There's no choice to a subject. There's no choice to a slave. Slave has no choice. We're preach, we preach it as if we have this choice. Jump in, jump out, get on, get off. It's not that, not that easy. Wasn't that easy to get out of Adam? That was pretty well concluded concretely and substantially determined when you were born. Guess what? In Christ, much more so. It's hard to believe, I know, but much more so. Much more so. Let's consider this for a moment. I wrote this, uh, let's see our time. we got about 10 minutes. I'm not going to get too far <clears throat> because we're going to go into Colossians 2 with this um, put to death these, uh, what is it? For if, uh, if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body. And we're going to see the whole reality of we are not debtors and this whole reality that, that he's saying in these verses, it is said in Colossians chapter 2 as well and where we're going to read it. But we may read the verses and then have to go into our next Wednesday with it. In fact, this is going to be a Thursday because uh, this is Wednesday night. I'm recording this crazy day, and um, I'll push this up, and it'll be there uh, Thursday. So this is a Thursday class. <laughs> so let's consider this, and I wrote this down. What does it mean to be a debtor? Because he says we are not debtors to the flesh, but let's just consider what it means to be a debtor. It means that we are under God obligation, indebted to a particular person or an institution. That indebted indebtedness usually holds due to a particular benefit or an assistance that has been derived from that thing 
that person, that institution to ourselves. So you're indebted. And that particular person institution provided you something that you could not otherwise receive. You couldn't get it in any other way. It had to be given to you and you benefited from that. And this is another meaning of indebtedness or obligation. The indebtedness is derived because of a benefit given that could not be acquired on our part or by our own abilities. This now subjects you or subjects you, binds you, to that thing, obligating you to it because of this assistance. For instance, a bank gives you money. And you could not have come up or gotten that money any other way. And that transaction makes you a debtor. You are now under obligation to abide by the rules or the requirements of that transaction. Paul is stating in these verses that we are not debtors to the flesh. He's pointing once again to the insufficiency that is consequential to our first birth. As those born of corruptible seed, subjected to sin and death, Paul is using this language to forego any consideration that the flesh, being in the realm of flesh, being in Adam, being in subjection to the first husband, being in that fruitless condition, renders absolute. He's let me let me say it this way. He is foregoing any consideration that being in Adam renders any substantial good or benefit to us in any way. Romans 7 again, what positive, what positive movement did Paul actually make except in the realm of spiritual, and you really can't even say it that way, religious pride, believing that he was holy and all of the Pharisees that he was a part of, believing that he was holy because he lived a right, he lived a separatist life. He was separate from the world. He was righteous according to his zealous works. But as far as God was concerned, as far as true spiritual attainment, as far as true holiness of the heart and spiritual life itself, there was nothing rendered by that nothing at all that's why he could say I counted it all as dung for him the result I believe that I was actually producing it's him <laughs> and when he came I realized that's the result I've always thought I was acquiring and achieving no the result is a gift, not an attainment. That sounds off. That sounds crazy. But the result of spiritual reality, the result that God was always after, the result that no man could actually produce because under the law, God subjected man to his own vanity, that word. Reading the Romans 8, we'll get to it. He says he subjected all creation to its own vanity under the law. Now, he did that for a purpose so that they might enjoy the liberty of the sons of God. And that's what he's telling them they have here. But his subjecting all creation to its own vanity, that word vanity, it means empty. But in the Greek, it actually means empty as to result. Meaning, not emptiness as to a bit, a, attempts and zealous activity and trying and a, doing it again. <coughs> no, there was multitudes of attempts and zealous efforts not one result not one no not one <laughs> <coughs> so God by grace had to give the result that he was always after and that's our salvation our salvation is the result our, our salvation is not the starting point so that we can now progressively reach the, the result. 
or attain the result. No, salvation is the result. It's the beginning and the end. It's the conclusion of the matter. And you receive it at the very start of the journey in its fullness. So then the journey becomes not one of getting, attaining. That's, that's the reality of presenting this, re, this gospel. Because now, having received all, having with Christ been given all things by a God who loves us, who desires to give us this great gift, and who has, by new birth, the presence of his Son. Now we grow. Now the journey is not one of a getting or getting and losing, or up and down, or one step forward and one step back. No, no, no. <clears throat> You've reached the goal already. In fact, that's what he says in, this, these, in the 14th verse. I think it says Paul. That's what he says in the 14th verse, because that's what he means by they that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. Because the word led here in the Greek actually means to be taken, to be taken, even forcefully taken, and led to a destination. Not just led around or, where should I go today, Lord? No, no. Those who have been led out from the first into the second, led out from Egypt into the promised land, out from death into life, taken by the Spirit of God and brought to a place we had no hope of going to unless he brought us. We have been led by the Spirit to the conclusion of the matter, to the goal, to the destination point intended of God, and that makes us the sons of God. Why? Because the whole process of being led by the Spirit is to be led by the Spirit to the marriage with a man. The marriage to the man our soul was created to be united with. Those who received him, he gave them power to become the sons of God. Why does he say this? Because later he's going to talk about the very thing. The liberty of the sons of God was what? Coming to the hope that he subjected all creation for. The hope. Who, what is that? Christ in you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's such a beautiful declaration of a present salvation. So he is showing that being in Adam, being under sin, being born of corruptible seed, rendered no good, no benefit. Therefore, we cannot be subjected to it any longer because we are now severed from it completely. We have been brought from that condition, that pitiable condition, to one now as those in whom Christ lives. And therefore... If he lives in us, guess what he is? Made unto us all spiritual realities. Forfeiting all obligation that we may have or just believed we had to the first. Any, any claim that that husband had on that wife is now over. Any obligation that slave had to that master, done, over. Why? No longer a slave. Now slave to another master. Now married to another man. The obligation is now to a new condition. The indebtedness now is to a new condition. Yes, we are indebted to the Spirit of God, absolutely, but not... An indebtedness that makes us work harder and try to gain his approval and try to warrant all of that he's done for us and try to qualify for more. No, it's an indebtedness to set our hearts to know him 
It's an indebtedness to live in the gratitude to a God who has done such a work and has granted such a gift. To set our hearts to love the one who first loved us. The work of God by grace, delivering us from the first subjection to corruption, has rendered all claim upon us null and void. Because we are now under subjection, under obligation, under the full headship of the man of spirit, who has bestowed within us everything the first man made impossible. Please come, uh, I wrote this, please understand that Paul is not proposing a state of continual vacillation in and out of the flesh. That's how it's preached, unfortunately, in most of the world. But that's not it. If we understand the magnitude of the term, we are not debtors. We would see that such would be equivalent to saying that we can slide easily in and out of Christ. Unfortunately, many believe that too. He is speaking of a transaction that has rendered the ultimate state of being and therefore has fully released us from one, one captivity into an altogether new captivity. He's telling He's making a broad statement. He is not telling Christians that they can fall in and out of Christ, back into Adam or into the flesh. They were being in part swayed to think that the Jews had a point, had some divine claim to spiritual things due to their adherence to the law. Yet Paul is showing that even with flawless observation, when you are yet under subjection to the internal master of Adamic kind, death and sin, are only the only result. The Jew, regardless of their religiosity, the Jews, reg- uh, sorry, the Jews, regardless of their religiosity, are in a realm where death and sin are the only result possible, because they are yet internally married to the man of sin. Thus, source determines fruit. And when we are cut off forever from that corrupt source, we are no longer debtors to it. That's what Paul is saying. He's merely edifying the people of God in the glorious salvation rendered and wrought of God. That's it. That's what the gospel is all about. The gospel is not a presentation that makes men look at themselves to try to see whether they measure up or not or meet a certain standard. The gospel is the declaration that the standard has met you, that God by his grace has given your soul a salvation that it had no hope of unless God wrought such a gift. That the standard that you tried to meet has met you already, that the goal you were trying by religion and zeal and efforts of the flesh to achieve, that goal has already met your soul. You've come to the goal already because he is in you. That's the gospel. And that's what he's saying here. The gospel should not indebt indebt us, is that a word, should not present us as believers, as debtors, to continue to try to pay off a debt to someone we're dead to. No. Set your heart on that which is above. Set your affection to know him. And we're going to go where that is said in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to go before that where he talks about this very same thing of not being debtors because he's going to tell the Colossians the very same thing. Why? Because the Colossians were under the same assault. Trying 
are the Judaizers or those that were coming to them trying to get them to worship God according to law, to go to the law, to find something spiritual. So, hope this has helped, guys, and I hope the wind hasn't been too bad. Um, I appreciate you being there and listening. Love you very much. Amen.